and welcome to another episode of the Richmond Bigfooty Tiger Cast. I'm your host, Michaels, and with me tonight we have a very special guest. He played 228 games in total for 23 goals, and 207 of those were with Richmond. Darren Gasper, welcome to the show. Yeah, um, great to join you all, and um, yeah, spend some time on the on the Tiger Cast. That's it. So uh, we love talking about all things Richmond, and it's just great to hear from uh, from some past plays and just hear their story and where they're at now. So we'll start off, I mean, you obviously played for Sydney as well, so we'll obviously include that too because it was a part of your career. Taken number one in the 1993 draft by the Swans, what was that feeling like being taken as the number one pick? Um, well, I pretty much knew I was going to get drafted number one, so there was no surprises. Um, but, and at the age of 17, you don't really have a comprehension of how big it is and um, I remember flying across at the time and going to the draft, and it was quite a big event, but um, I was quite happy to turn around and go home, and I think at the time it was around of the time of schoolies, so I went back and had a few few weeks off after school, and yeah, it was sort of, but it was a bit, it was different, it was a lot different, and I was pretty casual, and from WA, the hype wasn't that big, so um, yeah, I didn't really get that caught up in it all, but sure enough, once you do... Once I entered the system, that's when I realised how big it was and there was an enormous amount of pressure and there is an enormous amount of pressure on the number one draft pick. Um, even today, I guess, um, yeah, there's a lot of expectation for those guys that do get picked up number one to actually perform and um, live up to that, that tag, even though they don't, you know, do anything to get it. Like Jack Watts, for example, is sort of battled with that tag, I guess. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so there, there is a fair bit of pressure with it. So how far out did you know that you were going to go number one? Yeah, fair way. Um, I actually, I actually had a fair few conversations with um, Richmond, even in, at that time, because I think Richmond had picked number two that year. Nine, nine, so, so I got picked. By, I got picked up by Sydney at number one. I think Richmond had picked two, and they they picked Justin Murphy, but they. I had, I had conversations with John North. I think John North, he came to my house along with Brian Waldron, and uh, yeah, they said to me that they would pick me if Sydney didn't pick me. But sure enough, Sydney did, yep. and and I went to to Sydney, and uh, yeah, Richmond picked up Justin Murphy at number two. So um, yeah, but so I, I, I yeah definitely knew I was going to get picked up yeah pretty early. I suppose that makes it easier to sort of deal with and prepare yourself for. Everything that was going to come your way. Well, it's funny, like you, yeah, as it's pretty young. Like as a seventeen-year-old, you've got no idea what's what's ahead of you. And man, I'd never, I'd never put a load of washing on, and never, I don't think I'd ever cook, cook cook dinner for myself. And then all of a sudden, you're thrown to the deep end. And I, it's quite funny. I remember, and I'm not joking. My first load of washing, I washed, the, I washed, I washed the. The Sydney Swans tracksuit, and I put it in hot, and so my tracksuit was pink and white for the rest of the time I was there. <laughs> yeah, I was wearing a pink and letter, white. Yeah, because <laughs> I washed it in hot water. <laughs> but yeah, so you're just young. Like I, was, I, I played my first game when I was 17 in Sydney. Yeah. So yeah, you're um, a young kid. But yeah, it was all good fun, and like it's quite funny. Like. You hear about, you know, these players now wanting to go home and not wanting to leave their home state. I sort of had the opposite view. I was, I saw it as an adventure and to go to the other side of the country. So it was very exciting at the time. Just on that, um, I hadn't sort of planned to ask this, but now you've brought it up. With the kids wanting to go home these days, yeah, uh, I, I feel like the clubs are losing complete control and it, it, they're not getting benefited at all when kids are wanting to leave so early. Is there a fix for that? Oh, yeah. oh, look, I think it's more of the managers putting a play on trying to get um, top dollar. And if they, yeah, I think it's a bad trend. I think it's disappointing. You know, some of these guys need to grow up and and uh, at some point you need to leave your, leave the nest, for example, and experience different things. That's just my view. Um, yeah. I don't know what the fix is for it. Perhaps... Um, yeah, I think I think the the WA teams just need to be clever, be clever about who they pick. If they've got two players exactly the same, ones from WA and ones from Victoria, I think they should just choose the WA player. I I, I don't see the sense in choosing an interstate player when they don't have to. Um, first and foremost, but then yeah, 
So that that will eliminate some of these issues. But then as for the players always wanting saying they want to go home, I think they it's a big cop out and they need to grow up. To tell you the truth, but how do you say that? Like, yeah, it's been I mean, politically incorrect, I guess. So. It is, but like with the way the fixtures are these days, they'll probably end up going home two or three times a year, and I'm sure the clubs will allow them to stay an extra day or go there a day earlier. Um, it's not like you know, it's not like the states where you have to fly you know, eight or ten hours to get to some places. Everything's pretty accessible. So I agree with you. I think they need to sort of harden up a little bit. <laughs> yes, but you can't say that. No, uh, no, definitely not. So heaven forbid anyone tries to speak the truth or sense out there in the but AFL world with the media and all that. But in, but in reality, there's only like a handful. You know, you look at the trade period, how many were there that were coming out and saying they wanted to go home? or want, You know, there's not that many, really. So I think it's sort of gets beaten up a little bit and, uh, you know, so well, Bryce Gibbs wanted to go back to Adelaide and, cause, but he's had a big he, – he's done it. He's been in Melbourne for the last, what, 10 years or something yeah, or other. So he's right. sort of – and same as Danger. And I guess the same with Gary Ablett to an extent. Like Gary Ablett's, you know, 31 and he's been up there for seven years. So I can sort of understand that. But it's when the young kids turn around and say they want to go home, that's where I sort of say, oh, hang on, that's a bit ridiculous. So, yeah, and that's where the clubs get burned a little bit because they put their effort into developing these kids and then all of a sudden they want to jump ship. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. So, All right, back to yourself, though. Um, were you always a defender as a kid in your junior days? Yeah, pretty much. I, look, when I was – I played a fair bit on ball as a, as a sort of ruckman or ruck rover, um, you know, sort of through my mid-teens. And then, um, and then when I went to – yeah, I, yeah more, more, I guess more midfielder and on ball. Um, and then when I started playing – seniors because I grew up playing in the South Fremantle so I played senior footy for South Fremantle and then when I started playing senior footy I was sort of earmarked as sort of centre half back half back and played in those areas and then um, once I got into the AFL system yeah predominantly played in the back line and then yeah that's how yeah, so you're always pretty comfortable down there, which makes it easier as well. Because it's weird the amount of times you speak to people who are, you know, playing even as a Ford potentially, and then they get drafted, and the only spot they, really, they can really play in is down back just to fit into the team. And they've got to fully adjust. So, yeah, yeah, no, I sort of, it's yeah. I, I remember playing in a in a waffle game. So I was playing for South Fremantle. I actually played on Tony Modra, and I was like 16, and I played on Modra. Like even for whatever reason the. South Roman or Waffle, it was like a pre-season game and they thought, oh yeah, this kid can play. And so all of a sudden I was like 16 playing on Modra when Modra was in his prime. It was quite Jesus. funny. I was in a practice game up in Kalgoorlie. So, wow. That, yeah. that was nice of the coach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm playing, like in 93, Modra was like kicking 10 goals a game and here I was a 16-year-old playing on Modra. So, what do you do to was, stop that? I mean, you seem sort of Take take the AFL guys to the cleaners, and then you're given the task. How do you try and stop him? I was, I guess, it was. Um, it's a, as much as anything, it's a mindset thing. Um, I think, and you see it with younger players; they can get overawed. And you know, when a young kid comes in, they just don't look overawed. I guess, um, yeah, it's definitely a mindset thing. I guess you know, the competitive nature kicks in, and you just work your way through the situation. Whereas some some younger players, you see them, they get overawed with the situation and they do things that they wouldn't normally do yep. in when they're playing football at the lower levels. So I guess I was sort of had a level head to be able to adjust and deal with the situation. So. And you played 21 games with the Swans before coming across to Richmond in the 96 pre-season draft. What were yep. the reasons for wanting to change clubs early on in your career? Yeah, so what happened, so I'd had two years in... Sydney, and like I said earlier, I actually was close to coming to Richmond, or I actually put my hand up to want to come to Richmond when I first got drafted, and that didn't work out. And then, and then, luckily enough, well, as it turned out, so Sydney took Stuart Maxfield in a preseason draft concession that they had, which gave Richmond a return draft pick. I think it was number two or three in the preseason draft, and so sure enough, so I spoke to Robert Walls at the time and Brian Waldron once again. And we talked about me moving to Sydney via the draft. And we knew that Melbourne wouldn't pick me up because of the way it worked out. And uh, I said, you know what? I, I'd, been, I'd just been offered a uh, – I think Sydney offered me a pretty ordinary contract at the time. So I said, you know what? I've always wanted to go to Melbourne, always wanted to play for Richmond, big club. So I just, on a whim, just said, you know what? Yep, let's do it. And uh, – 
as it turned out, it uh, it all worked out, and I was able to get to Richmond via the draft. So and was uh, Robert Walls a pretty big influence on all that? It, it just from everything I sort of read and heard from when it all happened, it seemed like he was a pretty big influence and factor, even from the club perspective, in getting you across. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was definitely. I think um, yeah, Wolsey. I think I played a couple. Or I think I played a couple of good games against Brisbane when he was coach of. Brisbane, so he got to see me firsthand as a coach, and and then um, yeah, he had a fair bit to do to get me there. And so did Wally, Brian Waldron. Like I said, Brian Waldron, uh, we had a pretty good relationship when I first got drafted to Sydney because they were they were talking to me then. So they, I knew them pretty well, and they knew my family and everything. So um, I guess they knew what they what they were getting when they um, were trying to get me. So Wally, Brian Waldron, and um, Robert Walls were both influential. And how long after you were selected by Richmond did it take to make the move down to, to Melbourne from Sydney? Oh, pretty quick. Um, mate, it would have been... It, yeah, I can't remember the timeline exactly, but it, it, it all felt like it was in the space of a couple of weeks, really. Like, it all just really happened quickly. So from the time that I made the decision um, to the time to going, um, I moved down. And I think I moved down before the draft and... I was. I remember. I remember training with Kevin Morris because Kevin Kevin was the assistant coach, and I remember yeah, training with him in some secret location because I wasn't meant to be training with anyone but prior to the draft. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, remember, I remember running around in these obscure parks with Kevin doing some handball drills and training on the quiet before I got drafted. So. But uh, yeah, so it all happened pretty quickly, and uh, yeah, before I knew, it, I was yeah lining up in my first game against Jason Dunstall at Waverley was my first game and uh, I was playing against Hawthorne. So. What, a, what a baptism of fire that is. <laughs> I think you yeah. also had, um, you had Tony Lockett as well pretty early on in your time yes. with us too, didn't you? I remember, so, so I played the pre-season games and then missed the first game of the year because I had a slight hamstring. So we played Essendon in round one at the MCG and I think Richo kicked seven or eight goals in that game. But then... Game two, we played Hawthorne at Waverley, and yeah, I played. I lined up on Dunstall, and Dunstall had a pretty good game actually. Dunstall only kicked, I think he kicked two goals, and we won the game, which was good. And then round the round three, we went to Brisbane, I'm pretty sure. And then round four, I played on Tony. I played against the Swans, and I was all of a sudden lining up on Tony Lockett. So what was that like? Did he, I mean, he obviously had a, a bit of a hot head. Did he? Say anything to you, or was he just? Yeah, about his no, it, didn't, it didn't say much. I had a I had a really good first half. I like I was I was on fire in the first half, and I think he'd kick one goal up to half time. And then uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he got a good old fashioned bake by Rocket E at half time. <laughs> and then after half time, he was a different person. And the first time I went for the ball, I just coughed one in the back of the head, and I reckon I played the rest of the game. In, with concussion, if you did the concussion test now, you just I wouldn't have passed, no way. And I think Plugger got on top of me in the second half, partly because he knocked me out <laughs> the first contest. So I was like, my timing was all out. But uh, yeah, so it was a, it was a pretty good game. I had a good game, but then I think they ended up winning. But yeah, it was a it was a good experience. So Plugger, because uh, I, I sort of had the benefit of actually you know being a teammate with him, so I knew what he was like, knew his movements. So I sort of had a bit of an advantage, I guess. But um, nothing can prepare you for when Plugger got really angry because he was a fierce competitor and uh, unlike any other that I'd ever experienced. And well, I guess, yeah, on the return trip with Dunstall, when I played him later in the year, I saw the same I saw the same <laughs> angry sort of person with Dunstall as well. So. I was about to ask, leading into those games, how do you pre- like prepare and plan yourself to take on guys like that? It just must be somewhat daunting. You just gotta. It's it becomes a bit. It's it becomes a game of um, percentages. Like you got to play the percentages. You got to say, well, you know, if I do ninety five percent of the things right, which you know, like, yeah. So you sort of break it down, and you can't get too overawed with their history or what they've done in the past. That all, always comes into it, but then it kicks you into going back to your processes to, to making sure, you know, you do the right things, get in the right positions. And sure enough, like if you work through it, you can sort of 
you know, like I, you, you back yourself. Like I was always, always reasonably confident with my physical ap- ability. It, it comes down to mental because, you know, when you're playing on those gun full forwards, it's all about timing and leading. And you know, Plugger's not that quick, but he's quick to make movements and his first steps that is qu- really quick. So you got to be right on with every step that they take. So it's just a game of concentration and playing the percentages. So. And even though they were noted goal kickers, you kicked 23 yourself. But the one I want to talk to you about is round 17, 1998 versus Geelong. Pouring oh, rain. We yeah. uh, had a quick counter attack and you ended up in the forward line and the ball was gone across the face of goal and you chased the Geelong play and you kicked it out of bounds on the full. You're standing there in the forward pocket and you got, got called to play on and you just casually snapped a banana for a goal. Um, <laughs> what was going yeah. through your mind there? Well, that was a great goal. It was a good goal, yeah. I actually kicked two goals that game. I was playing, um, I think I had like six or seven possessions, two goals. So I always, I always tried to run down the ground to take my man out of position. And, and once you got past halfway, it was always, I always had the idea of game on, how much chance to get a goal here? Because, and then uh, that one in particular, it just kept on going further and further. And, and I think I was on Barnes, and then I sort of knocked it back. He kicked it out, and then um, I sort of went to do the fake pass on the inside. There was no way I was going to pass it, and then I just threw it on the boot. And, yeah, sure enough, it went straight through in front of a big crowd and on really on a really wet day. I think the fi- we only kicked about eight goals for the game. So. Yeah, it was pretty low scoring. And it was a pretty casual celebration. I thought you might have gotten up and about for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're not. I'm just not. You're just not used to it. Like, I didn't know what to do, really. <laughs> I, um, yeah, you sort of, uh, yeah, you're just not used to doing the celebration, and <laughs> then you, you, and then the other thing, you got to run so far back. So I'm like, oh shit, I can't sit here. I'm sorry for the language. You can't sit here and celebrate. It's not like you're a four where you can just run around and celebrate. You got to go. Oh, I got to get all the way back to my position, which was at yeah. the time it's full back. So I've got to start get on my bike here. So no time to celebrate. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You should have just sent one of the Fords down there and said, no, I've got it down here, boys. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, I, kicked, I ended up doing the same thing. I kicked another one from a free kick later in that, I think it was, I don't know, later in that game. So that was probably my highest scoring game. So. Do, when you have moments like that, do you ever think, just to say to the coach, maybe chuck me down here a bit more and this is what I'll give you? No, it was a funny one. I actually really enjoyed kicking goals on your forward. So I remember, I, you know, because it's like a little challenge during a game you don't get many you know as a full back you don't get many wins like you know you can punch the ball out and you know you get a little you get a little cheer from the crowd but it's nothing compared to your, your full forward kicking a bag of goals so when you get one back on them it's it, it's really rewarding so um I, I used to always try and yeah get down there to try and get a goal and when you do get them it was uh it, it was a real sense of achievement yeah absolutely. It's so hard to do it like to get down there and score a goal on a gun forward you just don't get those opportunities very often so no. when, when you did do it it was quite good oh That's yeah I, I got a, I, I got a few on on carry and a few on grant and those those goals i'll never forget them because yeah they it's just so hard to get them off you know, get down there, drag them into the forward line, turn around, take a mark, or get into a position to get the goal. So when you do get them, it's yeah, it is lots of fun. Yeah, I suppose Alex Rance tried the same thing this year. I think it was against Fremantle. He just drifted down there and nailed yeah. one from forty-five. So yeah, um, yeah. it's good, good to see it. Uh, in two thousand and two thousand one, you had a pretty good year. So being selected all Australian in both years is that something yeah. you must be extremely proud of? All Australian, that's huge. Yeah, no, I had um, that, that were good years. Um, I reckon I was pretty unlucky in '98 to tell you the truth. And even '97, I look at it and I go, oh, some of the guys that got that got picked in that side, I was, I was at the time, I was pretty up. I was, God, I was pretty frustrating. So then, finally, to get it in 2000 and 2001, yeah, it was it was good. I was pretty happy with it because it's sort of like recognition of your, your year. And in 2000, I only I think I had it. I had a broken cheekbone. I had a couple of other injuries. I only played like 16 games, but I had a pretty good year at the same time. So. And 2001 was even better again because you, of course, won the Jack Dyer medal. Uh, that must have been something you maybe not expected when you started out as a junior that you're ever going to win a club best and fairest. What, what was that night like for you? Oh, yeah, it was good. Um, it was at the time. I remember it clearly. Well, it was it was a double-edged sword. I, um, we'd lost the prelim a couple of weeks earlier, or about a week earlier. We had a heap of retirements. And uh, so whilst it was exciting to win the Jack Dye medal, it was sort of a frustrating time because we just missed out on making the grand final. 
um, having lost to Brisbane in Brisbane. So whilst it was good having the individual honour, it was at the same time it was really frustrating having lost that prelim because um, we had a pretty strong side that year and we were pretty competitive. But, yeah, personally it was one of those things. It was good to win it, especially because – in 2000, I just missed out to Andy Callaway, and uh, like I said, I played like six, I think 16 or 17 games and came second, and so to follow up the next year and win it, it was quite good. And speaking of the final series in 2001, the semi-final win against Carlton was, was huge for the club. What do you remember about that game, and what was the feeling like after the siren within the group? Yeah, that was. Uh, it's funny the memories you have, but that was the week of September 11, so... It's funny. I just remember. I remember Danny Frawley's speech. I think on the Tuesday when September 11 was on the Monday night. Matty Lloyd had headbutted me in the qualifying final, so I went to the. I'd been to the um, tribunal the night before. Matty Lloyd got one week, and and I was like, you know, and finals was massive, and it was the first time Richard had been in the finals for a while. So the build up, and so the first final we'd lost, and the the you know you just got caught up in it, and then September 11 happened on the Monday night, and then everything changed. The whole final series and the atmosphere was totally different because the world had changed on that night, and you can imagine. And so going into the game was just the most surreal feeling. Um, going in, knowing, yeah, this game's really important, but after seeing what we'd just seen and the week that was, it sort of doesn't feel the same. Yeah. Albeit on game day, you kicked in and, and, and you realised that this is actually happening now, we've got to play. But um, the game itself wasn't a great game. Um, when you look back at it, it was really windy and blustery conditions. But we had a pretty good side and we and we had some good players and we probably had more better players than, than they did. And we deserved to win when you look at the results. But, um, yeah, and even after the game, the celebrations w- weren't that big, I remember, because, yeah, it was just a really weird time in history in the world yep. because it's so much uncertainty. So um, a lot different than this year when Richmond got in those people that uh, can remember it. So Yeah, and someone actually mentioned to me and wanted me to I was a bit hesitant to ask the question because of nine eleven being what it is, but just to ask you just the fact that on one side of the Herald Sun there was a photo of I think it was you and Lloydy with the whole tribunal thing and on the other page it's the world's, you know, in complete yeah. shock with nine eleven. Like you couldn't have two further things if you tried. Like it's just it was amazing. Yeah, well that's it. Yeah. And like even trying to um oh, oh, like everyone that Everyone at work and footy was our work. Trying to go to work the next day and training, and it was just, it was surreal. Yeah, you do it. You go, you get on the train tracks, and you just train hard and do those things. But then once you finish training, once you finish work, you go back to the media and watching all what's happening around the world, and it was very surreal. So, yeah. that was a terrible time in the world. Um, you retired in round five of two thousand seven, and I'm pretty. Sure, pretty controversial circumstances to say the least. What happened uh, with that chat with Terry Wallace? Oh, uh, it was like it was just weird. Like we um we'd lost the first five games. I'd been okay. I hadn't. I think I played. I'd, I'd played every game up until then. I'd had a couple of good games. I, I yeah, I played a couple of games before. I played on Barry Hall and had a good game. And so I was. And I I'm pretty like I'm always my own, um most harshest judge and then so we'd lost the first five games and Terry basically said he wanted to play a lot of the kids and give the kids a lot more chances and said on that basis that I wasn't going to be picked at all for the remainder of the year so um, I was like well you know what I've trained all year no trained all pre-season I'm prepped for a season I'm I actually want to play (laughs) I can't and 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 I, and I sort of di- and I definitely disagreed with the um, the path the club was taking because whilst we had some young kids, I didn't think it was in their best interest to be thrown in the deep end. I think that they could have done it better and have. If, if he turned around and said to me, "Yeah, we're going to use you and use you know play you some games, but then we want you to coach these guys through and play with them and 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 have a transition," that made sense. It's sort of what what um, what what the good clubs do, but it was going to be a clean cut. I basically wasn't going to play and I was just going to play reserves. And I thought, well, 
that's what's the point? Like, I, I'm not going to sit there and play reserves. You need pressure for spots to have successful teams. So I totally disagreed with the path that the club was taking under the coach. So I, I just said, well, it's best that I stop playing altogether. So, yeah, what well, you said spot on. A mentor program would have been perfect because, yeah, chucking the kids in the deep end, they're just going to get torn apart. Um, so it is a bit disappointing they didn't go down that path. And I know, I know that a lot of people were shocked that that's how it unfolded, um, which obviously led to the retirement. So was there yeah, any yeah. thoughts of trying to go on to another list to continue your career? Oh, um, not, no, nah, not really. I, and I, yeah, I spoke to my manager about that and I was probably, yeah, I was probably a bit jaded by, at, at that stage and I, yeah, I wasn't interested in going and playing because I genuinely loved the club. Like, and I know it might sound ridiculous in this day and age, but I actually love the fact that I played, a, you know, I'm a life member of the club and I, and I love the club. And so the idea of going and playing with another club, it, it just didn't interest me. Um, yeah, I could have potentially played another year or two, but at the end of it all, I would be, you know, it just wouldn't feel the same. So I was quite happy to say, you know what, I've had a good run and if this is it, that's it. And I was quite happy to pull up stumps there and then. Fair enough. And obviously during your time at the club, you played with some great players. Who, in your opinion, was the best Richmond player you played with? Yeah, that's a tough call. At different times, different players were on the top of their game. So, you know, people automatically go to a Matthew Richardson. But I would say, you know, Leon Cameron was fantastic. Duncan Calloway was unbelievable when he was on top of his game. And he was one player that... Um, was all, you know injured at the wrong time. Wayne Campbell was unbelievable at different stages of his career. Um, Nick Daffy in in '98 was a, you know a gun, and he did some amazing things in his work rate. And Paul Broderick in '96 was you know one of the premier midfielders in the competition and won the won the BNF. So at different stages, yeah, there was different players that really stood out. So. Um, and it, yeah, it's really even yeah, I don't, Brad Ottens in yeah, at different stages was awesome. So um, it's hard to say any one player like Nathan Brown, the other one. He had a sort of a six before he did his um, leg. He was unbelievable. You know, I remember he kicked six goals or five goals in the last quarter in a game against Collingwood at the G. Correct me if I'm wrong. On, he was playing on James Clement at the time, and James Clement was like one of the premier defenders in the competition. And Brownie tore him to shreds. He'd love me telling this story, but um, <laughs> yeah. So at different stages, players are in their prime. Um, and you know, Richo in ninety ninety six when he I think he kicked ninety one goals, ninety one goals, and he played as a half forward. That was phenomenal. It's unbelievable. And, yeah, 96 and 99, Richo was probably at the top of his game. That's the best I saw. I know he had a good year when he came third in the Brownlow, but I, I would have thought the 96 year and the 99 year, he was, he was uh, you know, when Richo, it was Richo, Carey and Grant. I remember they were the three players that, you know, will be on the, you know, people were comparing those three and saying which one's the which one's the best. So, um, and yeah, so the, thank you. The- flip side of the coin the best forward you've played on you obviously played on quite a few um who was the toughest one you come up against oh, same again it's really hard to pick one because uh, maddie maddie lloyd he was fantastic but it's really hard to play on maddie lloyd when you when you when your side's getting pumped like <laughs> when the ball's coming out of the middle in some games and it's lace out on his chest it's really hard to stop um so he but he was a really good player Kerry was good. I had a pretty good record on Kerry, so I never really saw, I never really got towed up by him. Um, uh, Dunstall, so I played on Dunstall twice. The first game, I had a pretty good game. The second game, he got a hold of me. He kicked five goals up to half time and then got injured, and he was unbelievable. I couldn't do anything to stop him. He was just pure strength. But in saying that, I was pretty young, so I'd only, I, it was my first season as a full four, as a full back. But um, he was he was unbelievable. Plugger, yeah, really hard to play on. Kerry, obviously, I mentioned. Who else was there? Well, Chris Grant, he, he was tricky because he had all the tricks, super skillful. I, I only met Grant. He wasn't that fit. So I, I guess, yeah, I, I always sort of back my fitness. So I could sort of, once I, if I could stay with him, I, I could sort of 
Grandy, I found that he probably would hate me saying it, but I didn't think he was that fit, so I could sort of run with him most yeah. of the day. Richo was Richo was up there because I, I used to always try, um, I'd always have Richo in the training drills, so he was always tricky, um, just because he's so tall. Corey McKernan, when he won the when he won the Brown, or he missed out on the Brownlow in '96, he was unbelievable. He was one of the hardest players actually. When in '96, when he when he did he missed out on that, out on that Brownlow, he was very difficult to match up on because he was so tall and he was fit and he could run and he did it all. So um, yeah, so there's there's obviously a fair few players that come into that mix. And for any upcoming defenders out there, what kind of advice would you give to someone playing in the fullback role to give themselves the best chance of stopping a key forward? Uh, I always say, I always say, to, so I do, yeah. I always say to young kids, you got to be able to keep your eye on the ball, keep your eye on the man, keep your eye on the space, and so those three things that covers all bases. If you, if, and if you if you can do all those things and get into a position where you can continuously do those things, you're basically you're giving yourself the best chance of success because. Yeah, if you can see your man, you know where that is. If you know where the ball is, you know where the man's going to. You know where your man's going to lead to, and if you know where the space is, well, you, that's where your man's going to lead to as well. So you can sort of, and then if you know where the space is, and you know where the ball is, and we get the ball, well, then you can run into the space. So it's sort of it's sort of like a triangle that works to help you solve those decisions as a key defender. A very sound advice. Uh, and since you've retired, what have you been up to these days with work and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so after I retired, um, I had twin girls and we moved back to Perth. And so I've been living in Perth. Um, I do do um, radio for SEN. I've been lucky enough to do special comments for the SEN games in Perth for the last sort of seven or eight years. Work with a great team over here. Tim Gossich is the main caller, Brett Phillips or, or whoever they fly over for SEN. So that's been good. And I, for my, my um, full-time occupation, I'm actually a financial advisor and... So I work for myself and, uh, yeah, a financial advisor looking after clients and helping them manage their, yeah, financial affairs. And I suppose to do that, obviously a bit of studying would have come into it. Was that all studied while you were playing or did that all happen post-footy? Yeah, so I studied whilst I was playing. One thing I found when I was a AFL player is that they the AFL players get really good opportunities to do a lot of study and I sort of said to myself, well, with this free time, I've got to make the most of it. And I've actually found I played better footy when I did study. So I completed degrees and then went on to do postgraduate studies. And then um, when I finished playing, I was fully qualified from a study point of view, but actual practical, I hadn't done much practical work, but I completed all the um, yeah, qualifications to be able to step into a role. So... And on to the Tigers of this year. What did you make of the season? I mean, at the start of the year, did you ever think they were a chance to go all the way? Well, you know what? I, I was bitterly disappointed last year because I, I, I do believe they've got a good mix of um, senior players and young players coming through. So last year was really surprising. And I guess a lot of that frustration came out with supporters and, you know, anger at the end of the year and whatnot. Um so yeah, I did. I, I actually, yeah, I ex- I've expected them to do really well. You know, they they lost those finals, those three finals. Every one of those years, I thought they've got the capacity to go all the way. I know the media do their best to bag Richmond and say they're no good and you know all this crap about. But the reality is, in those three years, they had the team to go all the way. They they really did, and nothing changed between now and then. I, I, yeah, they they got the. the um, Obviously, a couple of Caddy and Prestia and Ankervis, the big those those three. But I still believe they had a good side those three years. They were unlucky, didn't go their way, and then things they they did go their way this year. And uh, and sure enough, with a bit of luck, the side didn't get too many injuries or ne- no injuries at all, and they just played a hard brand of footy. And uh, so even even the after watching the first final well, all year, when you looked at the way they played. And their, their intensity, and they, they just had so many things going for them. And the media, for whatever reason, try and do their best to downplay the Richmond performances. Well, when you look at the whole year, we, we you know, those close games that Richmond lost, 
if we'd won them, we would have been on top by a mile, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, exactly. I don't think um, people should be surprised by the result at all. And when, even when people talk about, oh, yeah, Richmond, they come out from 11th. Well, you got to remember, this Richmond side lost those fr- three finals, but we still won 15 or 16 games for the year. So we've had a good side for a long time, and uh, we haven't come out of nowhere. We've actually had a really good side. The fact is we've lost those finals um, for whatever reason, but with with a couple of small changes, the side was able to put it together on the on the park in the in the final series, and and sure enough, history speaks for itself now after the the big wins. So. Yeah, I mean, last year for me was just one of those really weird years, and you could tell it just nothing was working for them. And I mean, I think a lot of people knew that we would never play like that again. It, it just it couldn't happen. And then yeah, this year they come out and. And did what they did, and I think there's a bit of an ongoing joke with a lot of supporters that uh, apparently we still haven't beaten anyone good, according to opposition oh. people and media. So. Well, that's it. It's like, how, how long is it going to take before people take the club? Oh, I don't. It doesn't bother me because, uh, and I'm sure it doesn't bother the players either, because the reality is they've now won a premiership and they've got a pretty good team going forward, and um, I think they're going to be in a good. They should really be in, in a, you know. A, a, a strong position for the next couple of years at least. Yeah, definitely. And the grand final day itself, a few people have said they saw you in the crowd enjoying it. What was that day like for you? Oh, it was fantastic. I actually came across for the prelim um, game as well, which was awesome. Um, prelim, we went to the London Tavern beforehand, caught up with a few past players and then enjoyed the game. And then grand final day, stayed with um, um, really good friends that that I lived with when I was in Melbourne. When I first came to Richmond, I've kept kept in touch with them and we stayed with them again. And then, you know, going into, I think I went to, the, oh, I can't remember, one of the pubs on, on in Richmond before the game and then had the, had my two children and my wife and just to walk over and walk to the G on, on and to see all the Richmond colours on grand final day was just magnificent really. And then it's amazing the amount of people that, you bump into. I guess after being at the club for so long, for twelve or so years, you just you you do you you do build a lot of strong relationships. And then going into the game, I just remember bumping into, you know, every ten steps you would bump into a trainer or an ex-player or you know a masseur or, or an administrator. You just saw a lot of people that you hadn't seen for a long time and that you otherwise wouldn't probably ever see again, other, other than a big event like that. So. Going into the game was magnificent. Sitting at the game, I, I sat, I saw, saw a lot of past players where I was sitting, so it was good to see all them. And then just to have that whole experience with my two girls and my wife, that was yeah, it was awesome. And for the club to do what it did on the day, it was brilliant. When on the flip side, it would have been a nightmare if they'd lost. You know what I mean? So. During the game, it was a sense of relief that they did what they did. Um, people asked me, oh, did you cry when, when the result went your way? I, I always responded, you know, I would have cried if they'd lost, but I was, I was just genuinely that happy yep. for the club to do well and to play the way they did. So, and what was the, the point during the game where you realised we had it won? I think at half-time, a few people were coming up to me saying, oh, um, you know, what's going to happen? And I was reasonably confident saying to the people that would smash him after half time so <laughs> i was yeah i was maybe getting a bit ahead of myself but i said yeah we'll smash him from here on in but you know there's always that element deep down inside where you go geez the game does turn pretty quickly and it can turn but when you look at the replays we were all over them before half time and sure enough after half time it was game over and it was game over pretty quickly yeah, and the players have obviously had that belief the whole final series. I think Brandon Ellis said after the Geelong game that they knew they were going to be able to grind him down and run all over the top of him. They just really yeah. backed themselves in and believed that they had everything it took to, to beat those teams. Oh, yeah. they, they Every every player on the field for Richmond had a red-hot go, which is the minimum that you'd expect. And it just seemed that Adelaide didn't have that. They had a few players that just, I don't know, they just didn't want to... Uh, yeah, maybe they didn't have the greatest preparation or lead into the grand final with their lead-up games, whereas the Richmond lead-in games were just hard and contested, whereas the Adelaide game, especially the Ge- Geelong prelim, it was just a soft game, and they just got it on their own terms probably too easy in, in their build-ups, and, uh, and they probably played that way in the grand final, whereas Richmond didn't give them a chance, and 
sure enough, the uh, the result went our way. And what did you make of the the national anthem stamps by the Crows boys? I think it was ridiculous. I think it was. <laughs> I think it was laughable. I love. I love the some of the what they call it, the Power Rangers stamps. Yeah, yep, yep. It was just. It was embarrassing. I was like, what the poor. What the, I, like, I was sort of. I was thinking, oh. It'd be quite funny if one of the players just stood there, like I know, I've, you know, just an Alex Ranch just stood there. What were they going to do? Would they, would they just stand there? It was like, oh, apparently, are they, <laughs> are they going to do it during the year now? Or oh, yeah, if they did do it during the year going forward, well, what they should do is just leave a player standing there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Everyone else go go to your positions, warm up, and oh, they can stand I, think there. I think those kinds of things. Yeah, if you're worried about that to make an impact, you, you're probably losing sight of what's really important, you know what I mean? Like, you know, something's not quite right if they think that's going to make a difference. Yeah, exactly. Um, who would you have picked for the Norm Smith medal? Yeah, I had... Um, yeah, Shane. I had Shane in Woods, actually. I thought he was probably... When the game was on the line, he was really good and made a big impact on the outcome in that first half. So I had him ahead of Dusty. Dusty did really well, obviously. But then when you look at the the contested ball that he won and the impact that he had, so it was a fine line. I had Dusty and, and Shane Edwards probably neck and neck. Okay. The other one I had up there was um, Basher Hooley. I thought he, was, he yeah. was huge in the first half as well. But to be fair, the whole lot of them were huge for the whole game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no doubt about that. So, and before we go, we've got one last one. It's a question from one of the listeners. Uh, so it was Tiger Man 2 was the user. So he wants to know, which was better, playing your first AFL game or winning the 2006 Group 1 Australian Cup with a 60-1 to bolter, Roman Arch? <laughs> yeah, very different very different experiences. Uh, with, with playing AFL and playing your first game as the number one draft pick, you've just got a lot of expectations. There's a lot of pressure. Um, and a bit, there's a bit like that. Maybe every player has that. Well, well not, I wouldn't say every player. I had a lot of expectation on myself to perform. But then Roman Arch, what a memorable experience. And partly because we were in Brisbane playing a pre-season game. I'm not sure why, but we played Sydney in the Gold Coast. And so we were up in Brisbane, and that was the Australia Cup day. So we were about to head off to a night game. And I remember the whole team, we watched the race in the foyer of the Stanford Plaza Hotel before we went off to the game. And it was the most one of the most memorable things to see the horse do what it did and win that race when when I gave it absolutely no chance, absolutely no chance. The last three races, because I'd only owned this, so I, I didn't know anything about horse racing. And I'd gone into this horse with a few mates not involved with footy. And it, the, the three races leading up to that, race it came last last and second last so the expectation was next to not nil and, the, and that's the reason why i was paying 61 dollars. and for it to come out and do what it did yeah it was one of the most memorable experiences of my life and you know i've i can say that i've been involved with a group one winner <laughs> i've only ever owned one race course r- race horse and yeah and anyone involved in uh, horse racing they just know how unbelievably lucky that that is and i i, I appreciate that that's amazing. What a feeling that would have been after, with the odds it was at. So you, yeah, have to, you, have to, you don't have to try and do it again. You've done it once and, and that's it. Exactly. Yeah, and I've, I've often been asked to get involved in another another horse and I've just said, no, I just can't do it just because I just it would just be a letdown. But, and I, I, was, I was really lucky with Rome and we were really lucky. It, it went on to, you know, do really well. It came... I came third in the Blamey. It went up to Brisbane. Came third in the Brisbane Cup. It it ran on Caulfield Cup Day. It ran on McKinnon in the McKinnon Stakes. It came fifth in McKinnon. So it just went on, and it just was such a good, fun experience. And there's just no pressure on it. Whereas playing footy, there's just a lot of pressure, and you've yeah. got to deal. With it. The best thing about footy is you, those moments during the game when you know the game's over and after the first five minutes after the game. Otherwise, the rest of it is all just pressure and stressful. So. Yep. Oh, Darren, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your time and your insights into your playing career and, and everything with life after footy. Uh, wish you all the best and thanks for coming on again. 
No worries. No, I'm uh, always happy to uh, yeah to have a chat about Richmond and yeah because I love the club and great to uh, have experienced the Richmond Premiership this year and to all those Richmond members and supporters. I'm sure you all enjoyed it as well. And yeah, and I, I know you said before we got on that a lot of Richmond supporters saw me during the game and you know it was just fantastic to have you know a lot of those people come up and have a chat and yeah it was yeah always, it was a great experience. Oh, it's good to hear, mate. Oh, thank you once again, and um, yeah, we hope to see you around the club a bit more often as the years go on. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Thanks, okay. mate. No worries. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Richmond Big Footy Tiger Cast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and YouTube so you can follow all the roasts and toasts, the reviews and previews, and all topics Richmond. Also keep an ear out for our special episodes of interviews with past players. Go Tigers!